So gently closing your eyes. And as usual, getting into the sort of passive observer mode and allowing your body to speak to you. I always start the meditation by developing some body awareness because the body and the sensations in the body always are happening in this present moment and really help to ground us in the reality of experience so that we're moving out of the world of concepts, thoughts, ideas, even wanting and desire and just getting in touch with this bare reality of the way experience is manifesting right now. Sometimes it's not quite how you expect it to be. So taking time to ensure that your body is positioned as comfortably, as easefully, as conducively as poss possible. It doesn't always mean keeping a straight back or a perfect picture posture. It may involve leaning back on something, on a chair, or on a cushion. Sometimes people even like to lie down, especially if your body's tired. And this is very helpful to just remind your mind that this is not a time for trying to gain or get or lean into, toward anything, but rather a time to put things down, set aside goals, measuring, and all kinds of wanting to be anywhere other than where you are right now. See if you can become intimate by listening deeply to the feedback your body gives to you. Intimate with this present moment. Intimate with your own body and mind. And this deep listening and intimacy is an expression of friendliness. So see if you can imbue that awareness as you move throughout the body from part to part with a sense of warmth, friendship and curiosity. Noticing any areas of tightness, contraction or tension. And just gently inviting them to relax. Letting the body do the work of holding itself. Perfectly positioned. Just the way it needs. You're now on holiday, a backseat driver. Or rather a passenger.
And as you're sitting in that back seat, you're simply observing the changing scenery. Moving through different landscapes. different weather in the sky. Just see if you can pick up that aspect of experience which is changing. Perhaps noticing how the body relaxes, tensions perhaps ease as you sit, or other sensations may arise, stay for a while, and pass away. Some sensations feel very fluid. You can maybe sense vibration, pulsing, tingling, throbbing. All signs of impermanence, of change. Similarly, you may notice thoughts arise in the mind, changing thoughts, moving quickly or maybe just popping up and disappearing again. Or moods, emotions, mental feelings. associated with their particular bodily feeling tone.
everything arising due to a cause and passing away of its own accord. No sense in holding, clinging or resisting everything arising just to pass away. And you notice that as you are able to allow this process just to unfold, there's something very still inside, a place that is unaffected by this arising and passing and can stay equipoised, present and calm. Nothing to hold on to, nothing to push away.
you find the mind snagging on any experience, perhaps becoming drawn into anything difficult, sensation or emotion or a story in the mind. See if you can mentally step back, settle down again into that passenger seat and just relax your grip on those phenomena, impersonal, arising just to pass away. Recognizing the delight in freedom from desire, content to just to be here, easily satisfied. Now, as we're coming towards the end of this session, just inviting you to notice any peace, any quiet, contentment in the mind. However little or much, See if you can pick up on the nature of that peace, that quiet, that contentment. What are its qualities? How does it feel? And how did it come about?
So staying connected to your body, to the sensations, and noticing the effect of the sound of the bell ringing. Perhaps you can feel it in your body, in your bones. Very good. So since we're on the theme of staying connected with the body, I'd just like to encourage people to continue to be inwardly focused, even during the Dhamma talk. You know, keep at least part of the mind inside, grounded, connected to your own experience. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, session, we're going to talk about wanting today uh, and some of the gratification, but mostly the danger (laughs) and also the escape of that wanting into a different kind of happiness because the mind is primed to search and to seek for happiness. We are dispositioned that way as human beings. And uh, unfortunately, most of the time we're looking in the wrong direction. And this is very clear from the Buddha's teaching. So we're going to look at what uh, wanting is, how he defines that, and also how he defines happiness, and how we can maybe tap into some more of that happiness through our practice, and also in our daily life. So the reason uh, this came to mind, I guess, was partly because I'm starting to notice a little bit of discontent creeping into my mind and into my days, just in the last few days. And of course, it's not there all the time. So this is the first point, really, that, you know, these things come and go, even wanting comes and goes. But I find it really easy at the moment with the coronavirus pandemic to notice the danger of getting caught in any kind of wanting or discontent because as soon as I come out of the moment into any idea, imaginary idea of the future or what lies ahead or any fear of perhaps being stuck in this situation for so long that I'll never see Ajahn Brahm again (laughs) any sort of little movement of the mind in that direction brings immediate consequences and causes that discontent Perhaps it's because life has been simplified to the extent that it's easy to notice that, but I think it's also the case that developing that contentment and staying positive, staying connected with the good, the wholesome, staying, you know, in touch with our empathy and compassion is so incredibly important during this time. And then Ajahn Brahm also, we had a trust meeting today and he... um, usually does a little spiritual advisor's address, which is usually about one sentence. Today we got about three sentences out of him. Um, One was a quote, which he likes to say, by Oscar Wilde, and I think this is really great. So Oscar Wilde says, there are only two tragedies in life. Not getting what you want, okay, or getting what you want. And I think this is such a lovely nuance and that first truth of uh, the cause of suffering because the Buddha also says not getting what we want is suffering, right? Of course. But here we're saying even getting what you want is suffering. And of course the Buddha did go into that too, but perhaps not in those exact words. And sometimes that comes as a surprise to people because surely, you know, the objects of our desire are going to satiate that desire, right? Right? Or... (laughs) maybe not and sometimes you know when we actually get what we think we wanted it it fails to satisfy it fails to fulfill and it's a big disappointment especially if you spent a lot of energy and time pursuing that particular thing whether it be a relationship or I don't know something new like a new computer and it doesn't work luckily mine does work 
really well. Um, but, you know, it can be even worse in the sense that you're trying to fill a sense of lack, sometimes trying to fill some kind of hole, some kind of lack of a sense of meaning or lack of really knowing what's wrong. Yeah, just a sort of sense of being a little bit like, ooh, what am I doing? Confused, discombobulated. And we immediately reach out for something to fulfill that hole, to fill that hole. And of course those things never work because we're looking in the wrong direction. I remember still the first time I heard anything close to the Buddha's teaching. It was somehow in a centre spread of a magazine and it said something like, um, the suffering is caused by desire. And I have no idea why this was in a random magazine because my mum used to read things that I didn't want to read all about beauty and stuff. But I remember seeing this and it just clicked and I just thought, obvious, yeah? I mean, if you don't desire anything, that means you're happy, that means you're content. We only desire because something's lacking. And it works the other way around too. It's like something's lacking so we crave. But also we crave and then we find that there's this lack in, in you know, what we receive from that craving. In fact, the craving itself I wouldn't say it's just the cause of suffering. The craving itself is suffering. It arises in conjunction with that craving. Suffering arises codependent on that craving. And there really isn't much of a time gap. I mean, I experienced this but, um, during the year, uh, towards the year leading up to my ordination. And it was my full-time ordination because I'd already ordained for four months a couple of years previous. And in that year leading up, it's really curious how little temptations come along that you never expected. And I actually met somebody who I thought was just a friend, and then I started thinking, is there something more to this? And I remember this arising, thing, uh, this sort of sensation arising, of a kind of falling in love feeling. And it was very dizzying and disorienting, and all I could experience it as was kind of agitation, like real agitation with a sort of frenzied kind of sense to it. I just remember describing it as bittersweet. And for me it was really quite alarming because my whole life was geared towards ordaining, right? And that's what I wanted. I mean, I hadn't set my life up for a relationship. And uh, I just remembered really tasting that feeling of sort of, I guess there was some sensual desire there, although it wasn't particularly physical. It was more like a sense of a possible Dhamma partnership. But even that, it was kind of intoxicating. And I remember feeling like dangerous, dangerous. I didn't want to go there. And I was so happy when that subsided. I mean, I didn't go anywhere near it, you know. But, uh, but I just had this sense of why that sort of craving is actually suffering in and of itself. Or can be. I mean, I'm not speaking for everybody here, and obviously, you know, many relationships are very wholesome, and it really depends on your own choices in life. But my whole life was geared towards ordaining, and always has been since I started the practice. So it very clearly presented itself as a danger to me, a danger in the sense that it would lead away from continued and, um, and deeper practice. So anyway, I wanted to define um, what this craving is in the Buddha's words according to the second noble truth, the truth of the cause of suffering. And he says, Yayam tanha pono bhavika nandiraga sahagata tatra tatra binandani. And um, I forget what that's actually translated as, but to me what that means is that it's that craving, it's that thirst. Tanha literally means thirst which leads to renewed existence, pono bhavika, again becoming. Nandi raga sahagata means it's co-joined with a kind of um, craving and a delight in that craving. And it searches for pleasures here and there, here and there in every direction. And then he says, in short, it can be defined as craving for sensuality, so the desire that comes through the senses, pleasures of the senses, which is what we basically experience in everyday life and what many of us are sort of depending on for most of our happiness. And then bhava tanha, which is the craving to be, the craving to exist. And vibhava tanha, which sounds again a little bit um, counterintuitive, it's the craving not to be, the craving to not exist. So I guess this is kind of you know, can be likened to states of depression or serious, um, serious depression, maybe thoughts of suicide or, 
you know, not wanting to be. But it's still a thirst, it's still a wanting, it's still a craving to be somewhere other than we are right now. And in that sense, it never leads us out of suffering. So suicide is never, never an answer. We can't solve the problem that way. Right? And it can't be solved through wanting. If you translate tanha as thirst, then how can you quench your thirst through more thirst? (laughs) Through wanting the thirst to go away. We can't do that. We have to find a different direction altogether. So as I said, the Buddha did acknowledge that there's a gratification to be had through the senses, of course. You know, in some sense, pleasures aren't inherently dangerous. None of them are inherently bad unless they're breaking the precepts, right? So it's not about a moral judgment. But the reason the Buddha pointed us away from that is because he said that those kind of pleasures are unbeneficial and not leading to the goal of enlightenment. And I think this is so beautiful because all the time when the Buddha's teaching, he's talking about suffering and the end of suffering. He's talking about our highest happiness and he's teaching out of compassion that we would attain that highest happiness, that we can actually drink of that highest happiness, the real quenching cool water of stillness and of liberation. Yeah, they're the real kind of happinesses that actually satiate the mind, at least until you know we get out of this existence altogether. The joys of meditation are still conditioned and still subject to cessation, but at least along the way we get to drink our fill of a different kind of happiness. And so the Buddha has our highest welfare at heart, and that's why he says that these things are unbeneficial in the sense that they don't lead towards liberation. But he goes further and says that they're beset by fever, despair and vexation. And again, in that story I just shared, um, that was really how I felt, like vexation. It's a funny word, but I really felt like, oh, what's happening here? And like, kind of agitated and stirred up. And of course, this is the opposite of stillness. This is the opposite of the cause of happiness, right? Because stillness comes from happiness. Real, deep happiness. Um, Whereas wanting moves the mind backwards and forwards. It moves it from past to future. It moves it from you know, reality to fantasy, from this story to that story. I mean, for years when I started uh, travelling, I used to kind of have a hard time falling to sleep because I'd be thinking, where do I go next? What do I do next? How do I get from here to there? Even though it was usually like, how do I get to the next meditation centre and other positive things, there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of restlessness. And so that wanting, in a sense, was moving me backwards and forwards, quite physically, from place to place. And uh, eventually, after sort of 10 years of pretty much uh, enforced travel due to visas, it sort of subsided after a couple of years, and I wanted to stay rooted, but I couldn't, so I had to keep travelling. But um, one of the reasons for ordaining was just I wanted to stop, you know, I just wanted to settle down and experience a kind of simplicity, which was so different from the worldly kind of longing and searching and seeking, but just to stop and find a different kind of happiness, yeah. And it's, it's very beautiful to be a, a monastic living in Asia in a very simplified life, because straight away you get the joys of contentment and simplicity. And as that happiness grows inside, you find you need much less. You become much less dependent on sensual pleasures of any kind, really. You know, we didn't even have nice food. I mean, it was actually pretty bad food, <laughs> although the best that, you know, we could get and we're in a very very poor village and I'm sure we ate much better than the villagers there but even though it those were the conditions I can't remember being much happier than those early years of my monastic life and I think a big part of that was just the freedom from desire the freedom from needing very much you know and just feeling that I had everything I had all the potential for happiness inside you know I was turning in a different direction Just yesterday I read on um, one of the Facebook posts that um, very tragically a monk, the abbot actually, of one of the monasteries where I lived has been killed in a fire in his kuti, Um, apparently while meditating. So I was sort of pointing out to people that we do have to die one day and perhaps if this monk was meditating as he passed away, this is one of the best possible ways to go, you know, with a calm mind, with a deeply satisfied and at peace mind. But it reminded me of my experience in that monastery many years ago when Achan Mahabhuva was still alive and I actually stayed with him for about six weeks. And uh, the monastery was the most basic place I've ever been. Probably easier climate-wise than Burma. We had a lot more forest. 
so it was less exposed to the heat, but still very muggy. And all we had to sleep on was literally like a wooden platform, and it had um, a kind of curtain rail. It had a tin roof and a kind of rail around it, like a curtain rail, with plastic curtains, four plastic curtains for walls. So there weren't any actual walls, it was just a plastic curtain which would keep off the rain if it really felt, if it really started pelting. And I think we were there just towards the end of the monsoon season, so that wasn't too much of a problem. But um, of course this conduced very much to wakefulness and there was nothing to do but to really sit and walk. And the whole energy in that monastery was one of just continuous practice and not really sleeping. I mean, you could try and lie down in the daytime, but it wasn't that comfortable. So most of the time you just thought, I might as well get up and walk. And the mind became very sharp and bright and quite calm. And I remember doing walking meditation for three hours one evening, just up and down this walking path. Because, well, you might as well walk for as long as you can until you actually need to sit because you've got the whole night to meditate. <laughs> and so the conditions were incredibly basic, but I remember the, you know, just looking forward in the morning to boiling a little bit of water and having one sachet of like three-in-one coffee mix to make a cup of kind of really crappy coffee. And that was like so sensual and so delicious, you know, because the desires were so few. <laughs> Shirley's laughing, you probably know how that feels in a monastery. Yeah, so, you know, sometimes the less you have, the more you appreciate what is really there. And I've noticed, you know, the other problem with these sensual pleasures is that because they're not really satisfying, and yet they're also addictive, they lead it, you to wanting more and more and more. And this is one of the other aspects of uh, craving, you know, which is um, that kind of dependency. We become so dependent and, and basically um, a slave to our desire. The Buddha talked about desire, sensual desire in particular, as a debt. And you have to pay back later with interest on whatever it is that you've enjoyed. And especially, of course, if we actually literally borrow pleasure that doesn't belong to us, such as people who have an affair or a fling, you know, can create so much havoc, so much terrible pain and suffering in, in their partner, but also for themselves. And you can spend years and years and years trying to rebuild the trust, trying to fix the relationship, and also trying to forgive yourself and feel worthy again of that person's love, if you can hold the relationship together. You know, so these are all disadvantages of these sensual pleasures, of course, if they run out of control. But the next um, type that the Buddha talked about was this bhava tanha, and this literally means the craving to be. So this is not necessarily about sensual pleasures. It can include things like wanting praise, wanting acceptance, wanting love, right? Or wanting to be someone, wanting to make it in the world, you know, to have a successful career or a successful, I don't know, happy family. I mean, these are all normal things, again. But the problem is that often this doesn't happen the way we expect it to. It doesn't quite go to plan. And if that's all we're depending on, you know, it's just too tenuous. It's too insecure. For me, you know, it's like I want the Zoom session to go well, right? I want you to be interested. I want my words to come out well and, you know, make people happy and not to see people suffer. But this too is a kind of wanting, of course, right? And another kind of extreme example of wanting to be, I guess, is like things like extreme sports, which is again a kind of exaggeration of, of um, wanting and desire. You know, you've had the kind of simple pleasures or simple excitement of the senses, but that's not enough. So you need something even more extreme to kind of wake you up to feel alive. Right? And people will actually risk their lives to kind of jump off buildings without a parachute or what do they call those people? They just jump off a building. I think they have a parachute, but apparently a huge number, like up to 50% of people don't get the parachute up and then they die. Right? This is a kind of extreme version of wanting to be, wanting to feel like I'm alive. And perhaps there's a terrible numbness there or... I don't know, just a kind of addiction to that kind of high, that instant high, which is so short-lived. And it drives us in crazy ways, really crazy. 
And then the deeper level of this bhava tanha is just wanting to be, wanting to exist, yeah, wanting to experience, no matter what it is. And in meditation, this often manifests as kind of um, this thing that tries to control, this thing that can't quite let go into the process and just trust the meditation to open out in its own time according to causes and conditions. You know, and of course we need a little bit of direction, a little bit of so-called, I don't like the word aspiration, but a certain amount of directing the mind, like setting it on the right track. And this is why I always start off by talking about kindness and warmth, and because this kind of combines mindfulness with the cultivation of wholesome qualities. We do need to cultivate those wholesome qualities and not just let our mind go in any direction it, it pleases. Um, and the lovely thing too about introducing a sense of happiness, a sense of warmth, kindness, acceptance and contentment is that this is slowly starts to undermine and almost trick the sense of self which is the controller, the interferer. It tricks it into letting go because what you start to notice is the more you can sit back and become the passenger and allow the process to unfold, you know, especially when you're getting into some of the happinesses, even subtle piece of meditation, the more that starts to snowball, yeah, and every time this little self, sense of self comes up and goes, oh, but I want to know what's happening, or let me just put it this way, or push it that way, or sometimes what can happen is like the bliss or the happiness starts to come up and you think, okay, let me try and take it forward, and as soon as that happens, you've lost contentment, you've lost this being in touch with the present moment and going inward, you've started going onward, you've started moving the mind, right? So wanting are these winds in the mind that move it away from your object of meditation and onto the object of desire. Of course, that can be any kind of object, like fantasizing about relationships or cakes or whatever it is. But it can also be just wanting to go deeper, wanting to go further, wanting more progress in one's meditation. And this is very subtle. I mean, just the other day somebody wrote and said, how do I go deeper in my meditation? And I thought about it, and actually, what they're really asking is, how do I go somewhere else? How do I get a different experience than the one I'm having now? Right? Anyway, my answer was to go deeper in meditation, develop more contentment with where you are now. And the reason for that is because this contentment is the opposite of wanting. If you want to go deeper, the wanting is going to stop you. The wanting is going to uh, impede the going inward, the deepening into peace, contentment and calm. Mm. There's another really nice little, um, it's like a Buddhist cartoon. It's always monks. We should really, does anybody have a talent in making cartoons? We should make some non-cartoons. That would be really nice. Because they're always monks. <laughs> always these Zen masters or these like such and such masters. And they're always men. It's like we don't have a history as bikinis yet. <laughs> but um, anyway, in this little cartoon, there's um, like a Zen teacher and a student. And the student has this banner and he's holding this banner up to the Zen teacher and it says, I want happiness. Like, give me happiness, teacher. That's what teacher's for, right? <laughs> and the Zen teacher sees this banner and he sees the problem. So he scrubs off the eye. The eye is the problem, right? And this is actually true. The deeper cause of craving is actually the delusion of a self, the delusion of there being somebody in there to want something, right? I mean, this is kind of deeper in the process, but again, you can start to see this in your meditation because every time the sense of self comes up, it comes up with a sense of wanting. It's almost that wanting is the way a sense of self manifests. Yeah? It's the way it actually shows up. What, what point is there in showing up if there's nothing to want? You just start to disappear. Yeah? And take a really back seat. So the first problem is this I, so he scrubs that off. But then he still says, want happiness. And then he says, oh, oh, the want, this is a problem. As long as you're wanting something else, that means you're not happy with what you have already, right? And when we remove the word want, what's left? <laughs> Just one word, happiness. 
And I don't know, I'd like to change that word a little bit because I wanted to talk about the opposite, of course, of craving, which is about developing this so-called happiness. And the Buddha actually um, uses various words for this because I think the word happiness in, in, the, in the West, and in English anyway, starts to sound a bit too close to sensuality, um, a little bit unreliable also, like happy bubble, sort of bubbly and kind of unreliable. But I like the word contentment much more, and actually the gradual training starts off with contentment, being contented and easily satisfied with one's requisites, with one's lodgings, yeah, like being contented even though you're being bitten by mosquitoes in a dumb hall with no door, which is what I had to suffer for the first year at least in, in Burma, there was no door on the dumb hall. I think no windows either. Um, <laughs> So this contented with, with little, you know, and starting to find the happiness from within. So even if as a monastic you're sometimes a little bit on the edge of what your comfort zone might be, that can actually be a kind of impetus to look inside for a different kind of happiness. And the Buddha says one should actually know how to define pleasure, and knowing that, pursue the pleasure within oneself. This is from the Arana Vibhanga Sutta, which is what, Majjhima 129, I think, for anyone who's um, interested in reading these beautiful suttas. Um, and this refutes any claim or any, I don't know, misguided notion that the Buddha didn't teach happiness. The Buddha's saying you should pursue happiness, but you should pursue the type within yourself. And he contrasts this to the way of seeking pleasure through the two extremes. So he says that the um, two extremes are the ways of seeking desire, uh, pleasure through the senses, which we've talked about in depth, and the other extreme is the way of seeking pleasure through, I mean it sounds strange, but people seek pleasure through self-mortification, through fatiguing the body, tiring the body. I mean jumping off a building to me is kind of like that, right? <laughs> so people do seek pleasure this way, or working too long on the computer, in a sense that could be seen as the extreme of like um, tiring and fatiguing the body. I did that to myself today, you know, with the idea that I'm going to produce a newsletter and I'm going to produce a talk this evening and, you know, this, this idea that it will be worth it in the long run. <laughs> so we all get caught in this. Um, so these are the two extremes, but then the Buddha said that the middle way in this context is actually the way to seek pleasure inwardly through developing jhanas, developing deep samadhi. And he actually had different words for this. He said that these are the happinesses, the blisses of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, and the bliss of enlightenment. So he likened the bliss of these deep meditations to the bliss of enlightenment because it feels so similar because at that moment, at that time, you're free from desire, you're free from the five hindrances, and only then you can really enter these deep states of samadhi. So it isn't enlightenment at that point, it's still conditioned, it's still subject to cessation, but it's definitely kind of weaning you off the coarser pleasures of the mind. And this is the very beautiful, ingenious way that the Buddha teaches. He's not saying, look, it's all suffering, you're stuffed. You know, just put it all down at once and, and, you know, condemn everything you've been doing before. No. And he's not saying let go, just let go into nothing. He's saying develop the joy, develop the happiness of the mind. Then there's something to let go into. And I think this is so important, you know, that we understand there's something to let go into. So that bit by bit by bit we can renounce the lesser, the coarser, the less stable pleasures. And the counterfeit pleasures in a sense, and move towards these more wholesome pleasures of the mind. And you know that it's wholesome, you know that things like gratitude, inspiration in the Dhamma, spiritual friendship, you know, spiritual partnership, good relationships in your life which are truly loving and supportive, all these things are, are moving in the right direction. Yeah? And then we start to get into our meditation and we get the joys coming up of our conduct, joy of sila. He called that anavajasukha, which means the blameless happiness, the bliss of having no remorse, no guilty conscience over what we've done or haven't done during the day. 
And so this whole process is a kind of letting go of a lesser into a greater, into a, a more subtle, more refined and more ultimately satisfying happiness. And so from that joy that can start to come up in meditation, I have to, I've just wrote down a little quote again by Bhikkhu Bodhi, which I tried to share recently, but it came back to me a bit more clearly. And he said that the joy that you experience on hearing the Buddha's teaching can be seen as a kind of relief of the pent-up tensions of having reached an existential impasse in life. (laughs) I don't know if that speaks to people, but... It sounds kind of fancy, but I just think that's so lovely because it really captures what my experience was of coming into contact with the teachings and feeling so much relief because I had felt that I was at this existential impasse that basically nothing around me looked like a lasting, reliable source of happiness. And, you know, I had everything that I could really need and yet there was something missing. And the relief of finding there was a different path, there was a different way, you know, and a way really out of all suffering to a deep lasting peace was just such a relief. It felt like the path was open, you know, and luckily I had, I was young, (laughs) had a lot of time to practice. So that Pamoja, that kind of joy and gladness that arises at the beginning of meditation then deepens and refines into what we call Piti Sukha. And Piti can be translated as a kind of rapture or a kind of bliss. It's a kind of delight in the practice. So if you're practicing with breath meditation, it's when the breath starts to feel very delightful and very easy to be with, like it kind of captures your attention It's not a force anymore. You don't have to use this controlling, this sense of ego and self. It doesn't have to be so involved. It starts to sustain itself naturally on the breath because you're getting some delight there, yeah? And the process starts to become natural. And at this point, it's interesting because that's when you see that whenever you interfere, it tends to recede. (laughs) The happiness tends to recede. So it's quite a learning process. And then it deepens into what we call sukha which is um, often translated as happiness. But I think, I like Shaila Catherine's translation. She's a really great jhana teacher in America, California, and very deeply experienced practitioner. So she's one of my teachers too. And um, she translates sukha as contentment. And in the suttas, it actually talks about this kind of sukha as being like a thirsty person wandering in the desert and coming across a lake of clean, beautiful, pure water and drinking from that water. And it just struck me today when I was thinking about this that that would be the first time this thirst is a little bit quenched. Remember that tanha means thirst, craving means thirst. So now with the sukkah we're drinking from the water. We're drinking from a, a beautiful, pure source of water and getting our thirst quenched. And from that happiness, that is the proximate cause for deeper samadhi. Mm. But even with the meditation process, there's kind of different kinds of happiness that come up, even the wholesome happiness. Um, And I was reading in Ajahn Brahm's book, Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond, and he makes these really clear. He says that, you know, at at that point in the meditation, the happiness can still be quite bodily based, so it can be very close to sensuality. And I've had this happen sometimes, that you almost feel like it's too much to hold in the body. It's like really full-on bliss going through the body. And it's a little bit too close to sensual pleasure. So, I mean, it's not a problem, but just to notice that this is kind of the early stages and it can refine and settle a bit more and start going more into the mind. And he said the other thing that can happen at that point is that you start to get a certain happiness, the happiness of achievement, the happiness of, hey, I'm getting somewhere in my practice. Like I'm doing well, you know, maybe I'm a good meditator and I mean, please don't do this, but I can tell people, you know, that I got this and I got that. I mean, especially for monastics, we're not allowed to do that. So I think it's important to be careful because ego can arise and that's the problem with that kind of happiness. I mean, this is totally natural, and I think probably everybody will go through it, because this is the way our minds are conditioned to understand experience in terms of me and mine. I mean, that is just par for the course, until we really start to get into deep meditation and insight starts to arise, penetrating insight. So I find it helpful, I just wanted to share this while I'm on that theme, I find it helpful in the practice to start, when I'm practicing samadhi, to actually 
move away from the body earlier on in the process and not to mix the breath up too much with the body. I know that many teachers teach to experience the breath through the body and um, it can be very grounding. I also find that really helpful, really easy because I tend to be very bodily based as a, I guess just in touch with my physicality. I don't know, it's my practice too because I was spending years going through the body, you know, doing body scan. Um, but I found that was actually difficult at a point in the samadhi because I couldn't really get away from the sense of the breath being tied up with the body and go into deeper um, happinesses of the mind. So I find it quite helpful to start off by calming the body, but then to, if I want to go more into a samadhi practice, to just focus on knowing the breath rather than getting too involved in the precise details of the breath, just the fact that the breath is coming in, the breath is going out, and just the knowing of that. And then starting to tune up to the very, very subtle sense of contentment and happiness in the mind. Of course, the two are always a little bit related, but I find that helpful. So I don't know, I just wanted to share that. But um, the last point I want to make, because I have a tendency to speak longer than I expected, but... um, is to say that, as mentioned, you know, these deep states of samadhi are not an end in themselves, they're not sufficient in themselves to overcome all craving and all desire. But what is, is the resultant wisdom that can arise, the insight that can arise, and particularly into things like impermanence and non-self. And of course suffering as well, right? Because now you're getting a sense for what is happiness and what really isn't, or, or what kind of happiness is don't attract you anymore. It's just very natural, yeah, that once you start to experience the pleasures of the mind, you're not so attracted by things like loud movies or music or all the rest of it. You can appreciate, I can still appreciate that Led Zeppelin's really, really good music. I mean, I vouch for that and I stand by it. (laughs) But I don't really want to hear it because it just stirs up emotions, it stirs up kind of a coarse sort of sense of existence, I don't know, a coarse kind of experience in the mind. Um, So when we start to get an insight into, you know, the fact that these things are impermanent, we realise that, gosh, what we've been craving all this time are things that are just arising and passing, things that don't last, things that have no kind of um, reliability or stability, and even people, right, are subject to death, subject to ceasing. Even today, Ajahn Brahm, um, because we had our trusty meeting, so I'm mentioning what he said to me. He manages to get in a little, a little sharp teaching for me, even then. And I uh, can't remember how it came up, but he said, I, oh, that's right, I said that we can't have him coming over here for the tour. I mean, it's not going to be possible, because even if, if the restrictions are lifted, it's just too risky for me to invite 80 people into one building, you know, from all over the world and through airports and all the rest of it. And he said, oh, I don't mind coming if, you know, if the restrictions are lifted. And I said, well, I wouldn't. I just wouldn't risk it. You know, I couldn't risk you getting sick and dying. And he said, you'll have to let go. All things are impermanent. Sabbe, Sankara, Anicca. And he, he, he's touching on my deep attachment to him as a teacher there. You know, I'll have to let go. All things beloved and pleasing will become otherwise, will become separated from me. And of course, kind of having a certain amount of attachment to a teacher is a purer attachment in the sense that, you know, they're helping you to get free from suffering. Um, but still, it's going to cause suffering to lose those people in one's life. It's going to cause immense suffering. And I just hope at that time that I'll be able to tune up to all the lessons that I've learned and all the beautiful things that I've experienced through this connection and really take those teachings forward in his name, so to speak, in the Buddha's name, really. It's out of gratitude to the Buddha. But of course, you know, as long as we're still not enlightened, we get attached to human beings, we get attached to people, right? But it's important to recognise that the things that we really respect and admire in another are actually things that are latent in ourselves. Perhaps already in ourselves, we just don't see them clearly. We see them in the mirror of the other. We see them in their eyes, so to speak, right? 
because when I'm perceived by my teacher, I'm perceived in a very positive way, <laughs> with complete acceptance, right? And I have to learn to turn those eyes of acceptance right back onto myself. So he said that today, and that was kind of confronting, but of course, this is the case. And at a deeper level, there's a lovely quote that I wanted to almost end on, which is from Majima 37, where the Buddha says that nothing whatsoever is worth clinging to. Nothing whatsoever is worth clinging to. And this is because it simply can't last, right? So really, this whole path is to make us independent, independent in the teaching, independent in the sasana, and self-dependent for our own happiness, so that we have a lot more happiness to share with others. Yeah. We're never going to be disconnected, that's very different. We're always going to be connected and we can share that happiness. But the less we depend on others to fulfil our sense of lack, our sense of need, our holes, if you like, the more we can look for that fulfilment within ourselves and have something more to give, something more to give to others. Yeah. So I think it's really helpful to practice some from time to time, even if you are, I don't know, if most of you are more focused on samadhi or on insight practices, but the two go hand in hand, and it's good sometimes to have a different emphasis for the session. So today I just wanted to point out the impermanence and hope that that way we can loosen our grip a little bit on some of our wantings and desires. And just to end, <laughs> I have to get this in, is a lovely quote by Ajahn Chah. He says, the worldly way is to do things for a reason, to get something in return. But in Buddhism, we do things without any idea of gain. But if we don't want anything at all, what will we get? We don't get anything. Whatever we get is just a cause for suffering. So we practice not getting anything. Just make the mind peaceful and have done with it. Ajahn Chah. <laughs> sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> Thank you very much.